so good afternoon to all so so let us continue our lecture number uh, six and so are there any doubt uh, questions or doubts or comments if there so we can discuss and then i will continue okay fine if there is no as as such doubt so so let me just recall that in the uh, yesterday's lecture we have discussed uh, this reduction modulo p and using this what we were trying to discuss that if you have an integer polynomial uh, then in order to check whether it is irreducible or not enough to find a single prime p for which one need to look that if you reduce modulo p then the degree of f and degree of uh, this f bar should match and if somehow if, if we can see that this uh, uh, um, this polynomial f bar is irreducible then one can in fact say that this uh, original polynomial will be irreducible yeah so so this is the thing and then what we have seen that so uh, uh, irreducibility modulo p give irreducibility inside q of x for an integer polynomial even what we also saw that the arguments for reducibility modulo p is also uh, able to give uh, irreducibility uh, of an integer polynomial yeah and this was exactly the eisenstein criteria that we have seen here and the conditions are in such a way that uh, if you try to see the proof that this exactly uh, putting imposing the conditions that under which conditions if we have reducibility modulo p then it will uh, actually give uh, this thing uh, that uh, uh, if you assume that it is reducible modulo p then the p square will divide a naught which is uh, uh, already there in the condition that it should not divide and therefore we will get that f is irreducible inside q of x yeah and so today we are going to discuss a similar kind of eisenstein criterion for uh, this uh, uh, if instead of this integer coefficient if you try to look uh, the coefficients coming from uh, polynomial over t polynomial over another variable yeah with respect to complex field of complex numbers yeah so so therefore what we would like to discuss that if we replace so if you just replace z uh, so if we replace a set of integers by uh, 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 if you uh, replace set of integers by the polynomial ring c of t so replace and uh, so therefore analogous thing what we will get that uh, we are uh, so we, we will be looking uh, any polynomial f belongs to c of t of x yeah and so uh, one can prove that this this ring or integral domain can be proven to be isomorphic uh, polynomial ring in two variables t and x yeah and here what we are going to see that uh, if you try to uh, uh, analyze the things that z uh, zx uh, we were uh, taking and we were going somehow z mod p z yeah polynomial ring with finite field this thing and here what we can do is uh, instead of uh, this thing so we have this c of tx so we have c of tx right and now what we can think of uh, this thing that uh, we can go uh, this thing modulo uh, this uh, if you try to look c of uh, uh, here uh, c of x and i think c of x can be thought of as if one tries to look c of uh, t of x and then one goes modulo the uh, that thing uh, principal ideal if you try to take the principal ideal generated by uh, this indeterminate t yeah then one can prove that the c of t is in fact the c of x it will be isomorphic to this thing yeah and so therefore the analogy will be like this and uh, so so now let me just uh, state this as a proposition and then we will try to prove this thing so so the proposition what does actually says this eisenstein eisenstein criterion 
so criterion for this uh, polynomials with coef uh, with coefficients coming from c of t so so what does this uh, statement is that so let uh, if you take a uh, polynomial in c of t x yeah so one can write this polynomial uh, in x with coefficients coming from the polynomial ring c of t yeah that means f of t x if one write as you know, say a zero t so this so here a zero t will be the constant term in the part this polynomial uh, which is, is still a polynomial uh, uh, in variable t yeah so a zero t plus a one t x plus and so on so forth so a n t and then x to the power n yeah so we have this polynomial and now let us try to impose the similar condition that we have seen in uh, the eisenstein criterion for integer polynomials yeah so here we have taken uh, an uh, irreducible or a prime element inside this thing uh, z and then we put uh, certain conditions sorry it is here i think yes it is here we have taken a prime element inside z and then we have started putting conditions and let us try to put the similar condition in this case as well so what we will have that we have to take an irreducible element uh, inside this c of tx with respect to the variable t and that is very visible that t will be an irreducible element so so let us start with this assumption that suppose that suppose that uh, this the first condition is that t does not divide the leading coefficients a and of t that means a and of t is not a multiple of t yeah and so second condition is that well t is a factor of all other polynomials a n minus one t and so on so forth a naught t yeah and the third one is that uh, t square should not divide the uh, a naught t yeah should not divide a zero t then what is what does this proposition says that then this polynomial f of tx is irreducible then f of tx is irreducible in this uh, polynomial ring with respect to the fraction field of a c of t uh, and that will be the fraction field of c of t will be the quotient field as a c of a small bracket t and with and then the polynomial in x yeah yeah and uh, similar to that one if uh, f is a primitive uh, polynomial and here primitive i mean that it has no factor which is a polynomial in t alone that means uh, uh, there is no factor of t inside uh, this uh, uh, f then what one can say that in fact irreducibility in c of t x actually implies the irreducibility in uh, c of uh, t x here yeah so this is the thing similar to the case that in the case of integer polynomials if f is a primitive integer polynomial which is irreducible in q of x implies that irreducible in z of x okay so let us try to uh, sketch the proof of this and, and then we will proceed further and the proof of this is a more geometric in nature and uh, so let us try to uh, see and the pro uh, the thing uh, though it it seems uh, to be geometric in nature but the idea is exactly similar to the proof that we have discussed yesterday in the case of uh, uh, eisenstein criteria for integer polynomial so arguments will be similar exactly similar to the thing that we have discussed here and what we need to assume by the method of contradiction that suppose f is reducible in c of t x so let us start with that now suppose so so let us start with the proof and so suppose suppose f of t x is reducible is reducible yeah reducible say in c of t of x so what we can write that means that f of t x can be written as product of two factors 
say g of t of x and times h of t of x yes and now what one can do is the following the way we have started reducing modulo p there and reduce reducing modulo p that can be compared here with respect to the variable t here yeah with respect to the variable t and here what we are going to just see that so so t doesn't divide a and t and we will try to use this information that means if we so that means a and of t uh, does not is not a multiple of t that means if we put t is equal to zero in the polynomial f of tx then we do get uh, we we do get uh, certain uh, things which uh, actually we will get here for example a n of zero and uh, uh, which will not be equal to zero yeah so that's what we are going to localize it at the point zero so if we evaluate f of zero x this will be same as z of zero x and h of zero x and if we try to see what will be f of zero x by the very here so t divides uh, a zero so that will be vanishing all the things will be vanishing except this one and so what we will get that uh, f of zero x is exactly equal to a n of zero and then x to the power n yeah so which is a monomial in x yeah so so what does this implies so 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 let us try to see that this implies that g of say zero x g of zero x divides a n x to the power a n of zero x to the power n and h of zero x will also divides uh, uh, this uh, uh, what one should say a n of zero x to the power n yeah and so therefore what we see from here that uh, so therefore this z of zero x and h of zero x will be polynomial in x and in fact they will be monomials yeah so therefore what we can see that from here that g of zero x will be constant times some constant times say x to the power r yeah and h of zero x uh, in this case will be equal to some constant uh, some other constant times say x to the power n minus r yeah so that the product will give x to the power n here and now uh, what one can do is that uh, so using the fact that uh, uh, this uh, what we see that uh, this uh, uh, now if we try to put x is equal to zero then we can see that uh, this uh, uh, f vanishes at the origin yeah so so what we see that uh, so this implies that f of uh, means f of zero zero will be equal to zero yeah and so one thing that we can see from here that since both h g and h vanish at the uh, at zero with respect to x and so therefore f will vanish at uh, the origin yeah and in fact and uh, what we see moreover that in fact uh, one can see that this origin actually is a singular point of uh, this uh, singular point uh, of this uh, uh, what one should say in terms of if one tries to write these things in terms of varieties so let me just write down w to be the locus of this polynomial uh, f so all those points f of tx is equal to zero and say u is your vari uh, the variety defined by the polynomial g of tx is equal to zero and v is the variety defined by h of tx is equal to zero and then what does this uh, they are trying to say that in fact one can prove that this origin zero zero is a singular point is a singular point is a singular point of uh, this uh, 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 variety w r one can say polynomial f singular point of w and this can be proved just because we have this nice factorization f of tx is equal to g of tx and if we take the derivative for example with respect to this del f over del t del f over del t 
at say origin uh, uh, zero zero and del f or del x with respect to zero zero and if one tries to use this factorization uh, of this um, uh, this uh, uh, factorization of f in terms of g and h and one does the partial derivative with respect to t and x then one can in fact prove that there will be uh, so they will be vanishing yeah and therefore one can say that zero zero is a singular point and now what our aim is to somehow show uh, some contradiction and the contradiction since we are following the steps from the Eisenstein criteria in the case of uh, this uh, integer polynomials uh, and therefore we should get certain contradiction to uh, this fact yeah and so in order to recover this a naught what we can do is that we can uh, take the derivative of f with respect to t yeah so so what we are trying to see that if you one tries to for example take the derivative of f with respect to t and then what one can get that del f or del t at zero zero if one tries to do so treating x as a constant and taking the derivative with respect to t so what we will get that so these are uh, uh, constants if we treat and uh, they will be there in if we take the derivative with respect to t so all other terms since we are taking at zero zero will vanish yeah because of the presence of this f yeah and so therefore only thing that remains a naught t and we will again need to evaluate at zero because t is equal to zero we are taking so this will be exactly equal to the derivative of a naught yeah with respect to the variable t since there is only one variable in a naught expression uh, that is polynomial in t so we can write the full derivative d over dt and then at zero yeah so this is exactly this and uh, if you try to see that this is exactly the linear coefficient so a so if you try to take the derivative of the polynomial a zero t so that means uh, uh, the uh, and at t is equal to zero that means all higher degree polynomials should vanish uh, only the linear polynomial this will correspond to the coefficient of the linear term in a naught t yeah so this is the let's say linear coefficient of uh, a naught t yeah yes and so therefore what we see that uh, t already divides a naught t that's okay and now if somehow if so happens that d by dt of a zero of zero is equal to zero then what does this implies that t square uh, divides t square divides a naught of t yeah and what we are telling that this zero zero is a singular point that means already we have this fact here yeah so therefore what we are uh, proving that d by dt of a naught of zero is zero implies that this uh, actually a naught t in fact has a factor t square in common yeah so and which is a contradiction to the fact that uh, we have assumed that t square does not divide this uh, constant term yeah and so therefore such a factorization cannot be possible and uh, uh, therefore thus uh, we are done and so 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 uh, geometrically the singular point actually uh, in the book also it is mentioned though the uh, this whatever i am drawing it may not be the correct uh, uh, drawing or correct picture of what we have discussed but uh, the variety and they are uh, uh, telling that you will be something looking like this and since this zero zero is the origin uh, so and w is the union of two varieties so let's say it is u and say v will be uh, some uh, other uh, say variety like this and since zero zero is a singular point of this variety w and w is a union of u and v so the variety v will be looking like uh, this and here is the uh, singularity is there at the origin here it's it says, yeah so so that's the way they would like to sketch the uh, geometrically how these things is going on yeah so so this is exactly the eisenstein criterion with respect to uh, this uh, in uh, with respect to the if one treat uh, this polynomial in x and the coefficients coming from c of t yeah 
so so are there any questions or comments then we can proceed further okay so fine so 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 let us proceed further so this we are this, so this was about the uh, what we uh, would say that explicit factorization of polynomials that uh, using the results we will be able to know that when a polynomial when we can actually check that a given polynomial is irreducible yeah and now so let me move towards and as we have discussed in some of our lectures that uh, we have started looking the very uh, so this uh, ring of gaussian integers so j die and well so j sits inside uh, uh, this uh, ring of gaussian integers and uh, what we have also seen that this j of j die so this is an euclidean domain yeah so it is an euclidean domain and so so this is uh, units in z die we know that is a finite and in fact we know precisely they are plus minus one and plus minus i yeah and what we have uh, since it is a euclidean domain what we know that every element which is neither zero nor a unit can be written as a product of prime elements yeah and what we have also discussed that for example that if you look five uh, uh, as an integer and this lies inside sharing of gaussian integers z i also and though five uh, is a prime inside z but what we saw that five is not a prime inside z i yeah so because we have seen that five is uh, the product of two elements two plus i and two minus i and so so therefore uh, this is not a prime element all however what uh, we also discussed that however three is a prime element three is so three uh, three does not factor uh, so let me just write down that three does not factor so three does not factor in z i well and so therefore so so this implies that three is an irreducible or prime element three is prime element in z i yeah and so therefore uh, so we will distinguish the prime uh, elements in z and z i by saying that so the prime integers which are uh, still prime in z i we will say that is a, a gauss prime so that means that is three is a gauss prime yeah so that means this is still a prime element inside z i yeah of course it is prime in z but uh, the word gauss prime will say that it is still a prime inside z i okay so 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 this much so so today we are going to actually find certain uh, uh, are uh, we are going to classify what are the integer primes that will be a gauss prime or uh, what are the integer primes which will not be a gauss prime yeah so one of our aim of today's lecture is to discuss that thing and so before that so let me just quote uh, one lemma which i think is very easy and uh, uh, one can prove uh, this lemma very easily so so this is about uh, the divisibility again divisibility inside zi and so the first part is that if you have a gauss integer so so if you have uh, an element inside zi so gauss integer I mean that the elements of the ring Z I we will call as a Gauss integer. So let me write down a Gauss integer. Uh, uh, integer say which is a real number. So a Gauss integer so belongs to uh, real. That means which is a real number is in fact in fact belongs to the set of uh, uh, ordinary integers so what it says that if you have an element in z i which is a real it is in fact will be an uh, uh, integer ordinary integer so so this is the first part and these things you can prove or take it as a tutorial questions and so the uh, second one that if you take an ordinary integer uh, when we say ordinary integer i mean that any element of z yeah 
so 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 let me just say that d belongs to z well d if lies inside z it will also lie inside z i also yeah so and also so if you take another element a inside z that will also lie inside z i and so there are two type of divisibility and that uh, can be the here because z is inside z i and we have the notion of divisibility in z i and we have a notion of divisibility in z and so what this second part of this lemma says that if you have a divisibility so 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 let's say that d divides a in z i where both are ordinary integers will actually imply this divisibility inside z yeah and in fact if and only if this is so if you have two ordinary integer divisibility in z is same as divisibility in z i yeah and the third one is that if you have an ordinary integer say d belongs to z yeah d is an ordinary integer and let's say you have a gaussian integer a plus b i belongs to z i then what this part of lemma says that so d divides uh, a plus b i in z i so this divisibility is in z i what does it say that if and only if uh, d divides a and d divides b and of course as you can see that a and b are integers so divisibility here one can think of inside z by part two of the lemma yeah and so 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 this is the basic properties about the ring of gaussian integers and i hope you one can verify it by themselves uh, either as a homework or uh, as a tutorial questions whatever one would like to do and so so now let me proceed and try to discuss uh, the thing that uh, we would like to first of all try to see certain properties of the prime integers inside this uh, Gaussian integer, yeah? And so let me just write it as a theorem. So what we have, we will start say, for example, uh, uh, so let P be a prime integer. So let P be a prime integer. So prime say integer so prime in that, that is i mean to say that p is a prime which lies inside the set of integer then uh, well this prime will be an element inside z i then how this prime will look like inside z i so this theorem actually classifies then either p is a gauss prime then either p is a gauss prime or if it is not a Gauss prime, so it will have a certain factorization that is uh, very well because, uh, uh, very well known because ZI is an Euclidean domain. Uh, now what this theorem actually says that the factorization can be at most two, uh, so this prime can have at most two factors. And in fact, uh, it will be precisely product of two complex uh, Gaussian prime, yeah? Then either P is a Gauss prime or uh, uh, it is or it is it is let's say product of uh, uh, so let me write in symbols r p is equal to so let me just write r p is equal to pi times pi bar where pi is a gauss prime pi belongs to z i and uh, so this is a gauss prime so that means what we are telling that uh, so uh, an ordinary prime integer it uh, inside z i may be a prime if it is not a prime then uh, it will have factorization and the, there will be precisely two factors for this prime p uh, where uh, these pi's are the prime are irreducible elements inside z i yeah and bar here denotes the complex conjugation of pi and so so let us uh, try to prove this thing and then we will proceed further and so the proof that how we can start proving this thing so let us try to see this thing so can uh, so so what our aim is to show that so either p is a 
gauss prime rp is a product of uh, that thing yeah so so uh, such kind of results in order to prove that yeah, if we can somehow come to a conclusion that suppose uh, pi uh, pi bar divides p square yeah uh, inside say uh, uh, suppose if we have this divisibility say inside uh, uh, inside uh, say z i and uh, what we can show in fact that this pi pi bar is in fact a proper divisor of p square a proper divisor proper divisor of p square so that means what so proper divisors means proper divisor of p square if one tries to see uh, say for example uh, here we are talking inside divisibility inside z uh, z i and we need to somehow conclude that this divisibility happens inside z that means pi pi bar should be an integer and this should also this is of course an integer then the, this divisibility inside z and if we can show that this is a proper divisibility inside z and we know the proper divisors of uh, uh, p square inside z are either p and p square so therefore pi will be either an associate of p r pi pi bar will be equal to p uh, r pi pi bar will be equal to p yeah so i mean to say that this pi pi bar is a proper divisor and proper divisor of p square is uh, p itself yeah so somehow we need to prove that pi pi bar is either p or pi is an associate of this prime p so this is our aim is to somehow come to this thing and then we will case by case analyze the things yeah so so in order to prove this so so what we can see that uh, so uh, so since p is a prime integer so of course it is not a unit p is not a unit and of course it is also not equal to zero so since zi is a pid or euclidean domain so it has a factorization and let's say a prime divisor pi be a prime divisor pi belongs to zi say is a prime divisor of p yeah pi divides p where pi is an element say a plus b i lies inside the ring of gaussian integer yeah and uh, so uh, as you can see that if pi divides p implies pi bar also divides p that can be checked because uh, pi divides p implies that pi divides p bar but p bar is equal to p yeah so therefore uh, pi div pi so this implies that pi bar also divides p and so therefore what we see that thing that this pi pi bar if one tries to see that this exactly uh, 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 this a plus b i and times a minus b i yeah and so this divides p square yeah and that means what and this divides p square divisibility inside say uh, in ring of gaussian integer so this is in z i yeah and so 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 this divisibility inside z i and so if you try to see this exactly equal to a square plus b square so that means what that a p square can be written as so p square is let's say pi pi bar times alpha where alpha belongs to z i yeah now as this is an integer yeah and now uh, this is an integer uh, pi pi bar is an integer because it is equal to a square plus b square which is an integer so can we conclude that alpha is an integer yeah so so when so we can conclude in fact that this alpha is also an integer yeah so it cannot be pure gaussian uh, uh, integer because uh, uh, these two factors are integers and so this cannot be gaussian integer so it has to be an integer and so therefore what we see that actually so once alpha is an integer what we see that this divisibility is in fact inside z itself yeah so so thus what we see that this pi pi bar divides p square in uh, z yeah 
Now, so if we have divisibility inside uh, that thing, so there are two possibilities. Yeah, so the case one that can happen. So let us try to see the case one. So if pi pi bar divides p square, that it may happen that pi is an associate of p. Yeah, pi is an associate of p. Uh, so that pi pi bar divides p square, that is one possibility. And if pi is an associate of p, and since pi is a prime, pi prime in z i, so therefore this will imply that p is a Gauss prime. Yeah. Yeah, so this case will uh, ensure that P is a Gauss prime and which is this part of uh, the theorem. And the other case is about uh, this proper divisibility. So case two, that if pi is not an associate of uh, this prime P, that means what, so pi is a proper divisor. So this pi is a proper divisor of this P in Zi, yeah? yeah. So, 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 so otherwise what we can say that if pi is not an associate of P, otherwise pi is a proper divisor of P, proper divisor of P inside ZI, yeah? And if pi is a proper divisor of P, therefore pi times pi bar will be a proper divisor of P square, yeah? So this implies that pi pi bar is a proper divisor, proper divisor of p square in z, yeah, because this divisibility inside z, and therefore, uh, uh, what we can say that, and since uh, we can see that pi pi bar is a, a, a say positive integer, and here we are taking p to be a positive prime, we can say that pi pi bar is equal to p, yeah. And so in this case, P will be a product of two factors, which is where pi is a prime inside this thing, inside the ring of Gaussian integers, yeah? So therefore, what we are able to see that uh, this uh, uh, factorization inside this thing happens. And uh, well, so, uh, so let me just say a bit of this uh, related to this theorem. Here we are somehow focusing, maybe in the coming lectures, if we discuss so-called algebraic integers. Uh, and uh, actually here, what we are doing somehow that QI, uh, we are looking if you over Q, and if you know a bit of field theory, then one can see and that uh, QI is a quadratic extension of uh, a Q, and so degree here is two, degree two. And here, what one can see that if one looks uh, so-called uh, ring of algebraic integers, the notion of algebraic integers we are going to discuss in the next lecture. So we have a associated ring of algebraic integers of Q, I will correspond to precisely Z i. And similar definition here will correspond to over Z, yeah. So, so, so therefore this is a degree two extension. And if one looks the uh, corresponding ring of algebraic integers, so they are uh, kind of uh, having degree two. And so, so a general result in fact says that if you take any number field, uh, any number field over and number field by definition, it is a finite extension over Q, finite extensions of Q are so-called uh, number fields. So if you take any number field, and if you look any, uh, so one can uh, look the ring of algebraic integers corresponding to that number field K over Q. So this is, let's say number field. And one can look the corresponding ring of algebraic integers uh, if we denote it by O. Uh, so this is the ring of algebraic integer corresponding to this, and here we have Z. And so therefore one can check that. So Z uh, set of integers, so the set of integers actually sits inside this ring of algebraic integers. So, so this is this way around inclusion is there. And uh, uh, if you take a prime P, uh, ordinary pr uh, prime integer inside Z, so uh, it may, so there are uh, various, possibility is that a prime how either this prime integer may be a prime here or it if it is not prime it has factors and a general result actually says that so up to the 
of, uh, uh, so uh, the number of prime factors of a given prime t inside uh, this ring of integers cannot be more than the degree yeah so if if degree is say here k over q is n then uh, this prime will have at most uh, n many factors inside this uh, ring of integers so yeah and here uh, we since we are in the case of degree two extensions so either it will be a prime and so either it will be a prime here we are giving it as a name as gauss prime but in general if it stays as a prime inside the ring of integers it is known as p is inert or p is an inert prime that means it remains as a prime inside the ring of integers uh, corresponding to the uh, number field k or it will have factors and the factors cannot uh, exceed uh, this degree uh, degree of the extension and here it is a degree two extension so it will have precisely two factors here okay so so this is about a bit of a general uh, theme that goes uh, in this uh, direction and so let me now again uh, 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 stick ourselves to the ring of gaussian integers and let me now prove the second property i will again write it as a theorem and so what does this actually says that so let me just write down it as again as a theorem that if you have a gauss prime so let pi be a gauss prime yeah then either then either pi pi bar either pi pi bar is a prime integer is a prime integer is a prime integer or else it is the square or else it is the square it is the square of a prime integer it is square of a prime integer prime integer yeah so so what does this uh, theorem says that uh, if you take a gauss prime and if you look pi pi bar so so actually this also has a name if one tries to look the general results uh, related to general number field uh, uh, and then what one has this has a name so called norm uh, here norm of this element pi and so norm of this element uh, may be a prime number or if it is not prime then uh, so 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 if pi pi bar as we have seen here that uh, if pi pi bar itself happens to be p that is fine and if pi is an associate of p or pi is a gauss prime so that means pi is a, 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 some unit times uh, ordinary prime then of course norm of pi pi bar will be uh, some uh, uh, this norm of pi so so what i would like to say that uh, so this pi pi bar will be a square of a prime integer yeah so this is the property and in fact this also holds generally over any number field uh, of finite degree here number field i mean by the very definition it is finite degree yeah so so let us try to see just uh, the proof of this thing and it is i think again element can you now start proving uh, this theorem can you suggest me the steps for example let's start with uh, gauss prime so let pi be pi be a gauss prime okay gauss prime well so of course uh, pi will be of the form say a plus b i that's true therefore pi pi bar uh, will be a square plus b square right a square plus b square so they uh, so this is an integer right uh, now what we can write that so therefore pi pi bar will be equal to n where n belongs to it that's true now can we now proceed uh, uh, this uh, step further uh, so how can we proceed so i can uh, so what we know that since we one thing we know from this identity that pi divides pi pi bar uh, which is equal to n in this case now can one proceed and of course here pi is given to be a prime yeah 
yeah so what we can proceed further that uh, so uh, now we will use the property that pi is a prime and so therefore and I, what we need to show that either pi pi bar is p or p square yeah so what we can do we can factor this integer n yeah yeah we can factor this integer uh, uh, let's say n inside z so if we factor this integer n inside z this will give a factorization uh, inside z i well this factorization may not be in terms of irreducible elements but of course it will be a factorization in z i yeah which may not be in terms of irreducible elements that's that's fine but it will be a factorization yeah so what we can say that since pi is a prime so therefore pi divides one of the one of the integer integer prime factor of n integer prime factor of n yeah so so therefore what we see that this implies that pi divides an integer prime yeah pi divides an integer prime now can we uh, conclude the result Now can we conclude the result? So if pi divides an integer prime, so this implies that pi pi bar, pi pi bar is a divisor of p square, is a integer prime, let's say equal to p here, is a divisor of p square, yeah? Because if pi divides p, so pi pi bar divides p square, yeah? And now hence, so the integer divisor of p squares are either one p or p square, yeah? So one cannot happen because pi is a prime, so it is not a unit, so one cannot happen, yeah? So, so hence, so therefore either pi pi bar is p or p square, yeah? Hence pi pi bar is equal to p or p square, yeah? So, and that's what uh, we would like to exactly prove here, that if you have a Gauss prime, so pi pi bar is either a prime integer or it is a square of a prime integer. Yeah, so this is exactly we are able to prove because pi is a prime, so it is not a unit, yeah. Okay, so far so good. So now let me just move towards, by the way, any doubts or comments so far? No, sir. Okay, good. So now let me uh, move towards and let me just uh, uh, write down one of the important uh, results which classifies actually what are the prime elements inside Z of I. And so what does it says that, so let P, if you start with a prime integer, so let P belongs to Z, let's say prime. Yeah, then the following are equivalent. So so the first part is what that p is a product of two complex p is a product so let me just write in terms of symbols and writing so that we can write p as say pi pi bar yeah where pi is gauss prime pi gauss prime yeah so so if p is uh, p splits and so this uh, so if uh, so again let me just say certain words uh, we are going to use for example if this prime uh, which uh, is a, an ordinary integer and if it has factorization exactly equal to the degree corresponding to that number field for example here if p is written say as p1 p2 and so on pn then uh, uh, such a uh, such a factorization in general words known as p splits in uh, say uh, kro kro yeah and so so that's what i i was tended to take the name that if p splits that means p splits i mean that p has exactly two prime factors and p is written as a product of them uh, 
then this this fact actually is equivalent to the fact that p is the sum of of course p is uh, uh, p can be written as so again let me write in terms of symbols so p is equal to say a square plus b square yeah where a b belongs to z of course that is very obvious because uh, it is a gauss prime so that means pi can be itself written as a plus i b and so pi pi bar will be a square plus b square so these two are if and only if is obvious yeah now the third one what we have is that uh, that we have a certain congruence that uh, the congruence if one tries to write the congruence x square is congruent to minus one mod p so as an integer solution as an integer solution so so as you can see that uh, 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 if you have an ordinary prime p which doesn't stay prime inside z i is equivalent to saying that the polynomial x square plus one uh, high, uh, x square plus one is reducible inside z mod pz yeah so so this is the third equivalent condition and the fourth one is actually uh, if actually classifies arithmetically what uh, is the nature of this prime p that in fact p is congruent to one mod four so if p is not uh, uh, if p doesn't stay as a prime inside the ring of gaussian integers then uh, these primes will be congruent to one mod four or p is equal to two yeah so now one can list what are the primes which are congruent to one mod four or two so so of course the special prime p is equal to two is there from here and now five one can list five doesn't stay as a prime inside z i that we have seen 13 17 and so on so these are the integer primes which doesn't stay as a prime inside this ring of gaussian integers yeah okay so far so good so let me just start uh, uh, giving proof or by the way are there any doubts in this uh, statement of this theorem if uh, there is yeah no, sir. okay good so so let me now start proving so of course one implies two is obvious that i already told so let me start uh, so the proof uh, one implies two is obvious because uh, uh, if p is a pi pi bar then of course pi pi bar if one computes it will be a square plus b square now two implies one is also obvious because if p is written as a square plus b square then where a b are integers yeah a uh, belongs to z and b also belongs to z then what we need to write uh, so we can factor it as a plus i b and a minus i b yeah uh, so therefore uh, and uh, so we can write it as pi and this also pi bar yeah so so now in order to prove two implies one what we need to only ensure that pi is a gauss prime so what we need to ensure that this a plus i b is a prime this pi is a gauss prime now can you suggest me or can you say why pi is a gauss prime anyone of you can tell why pi is a gauss prime so we have proven certain theorems uh, before this uh, result and in fact uh, i think if you try to see this theorem that the very first theorem that if you take an ordinary prime integer either it is a uh, either it stays as a prime if it doesn't stay as a prime then it will be of the form pi pi bar where pi will be a gauss prime yeah so therefore if i to say this as a theorem a then one can here say that by theorem a so since pi a p is an ordinary integer which is written as pi pi bar so by theorem a pi is a gauss prime pi is a 
goes by and hence two implies one yeah so therefore one implies two and two implies one uh, is immediate now our aim is to somehow prove one implies three and three implies one that means if you have a prime which doesn't stay as a prime inside uh, this ring of Gaussian integer, then uh, this, if you look at uh, the corresponding field Z mod PZ, and if you look this, uh, 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 this quadratic polynomial X square plus one, then this quadratic polynomial has a root inside uh, Z mod PZ, yeah? And so the second that we would like to now to prove a one if and only if three. And in order to prove uh, this thing, this requires a certain analysis about uh, this Gauss primes. And so let me first state it as a lemma and then we will proceed further, yeah? So, so, so let me, uh, so the lemma is about this uh, special prime P uh, when, means uh, when this uh, prime p actually what does it says that if uh, prime p uh, is uh, doesn't stay as a gauss prime then uh, uh, this polynomial x square plus one uh, has a root inside z mod pc and uh, in a sense we are going to quote as a lemma which is actually uh, same thing that one need to prove uh, but it requires a bit of intermediate steps to uh, prove this thing. And so the, as a lemma, what we are going to say that, so let P be a prime integer, P be a, let's say prime integer. Yeah, then the following are equivalent. So the first one, what I say is that P is a Gauss prime. So P is a, a Gaussian prime. That means uh, this uh, uh, this prime stays as a prime inside the ring of integers. And the second one is that if you try to look the ring, so if you if it is a uh, it stays as a prime elements, and since it is a principal ideal domain, so the ideal generated by this prime will be a maximal ideal. Yeah. So this is uh, a field is obvious. So this, if we write it as name R dash, is a field. Yeah. So these two are immediate. And now third one is actually the main thing that we need to prove that if you try to look the polynomial x square plus one is an is an irreducible polynomial. Irreducible polynomial in the polynomial ring Z mod P Z X. So, so therefore what uh, does actually says that uh, if you have prime integer, so this prime integer is somehow related to the reducibility or irreducibility of this polynomial inside this polynomial ring. And uh, what is precisely says that if this prime stays as a Gauss prime, then this polynomial is irreducible inside Z mod PZ, if and only if, yeah. And so if one tries to use this lemma, then it is immediate from this lemma is that uh, one if and only if three, yeah. So here, what does it say that one implies three, you know, what we have. So, so let me now, one implies three. Uh, uh, here, let me write down one implies three. So one what says that P doesn't stay as a prime, that means P is not a Gauss prime, this condition says. And so therefore by this lemma, if we try to use that P is not a Gauss prime, if and only this is reducible inside Z mod PZ, yeah? So one implies two, now this uh, X square plus one, sorry, one implies three, it should be. X square plus one is reducible yeah, reducible in Z mod PZ X, yeah. And uh, if you have a, uh, what I would like to say that if you have a degree two or three polynomial over a field and their, their reducibility or irreducibility is same as finding a root, yeah. And so therefore uh, this implies that X square plus one is congruent to zero mod P has a solution, has a solution and solution means as an let's say integer solution 
integer solution. So therefore, this exactly is x square is congruent to minus one mod p has an integer solution. So one implies three is there. And similarly, three implies one is again obvious because if it is reducible, this implies p is not a Gauss prime. And if it is not a Gauss prime, then theorem A, theorem A will say that, theorem A will say that p is not a Gauss prime means p is a pi pi bar. Yeah. So therefore three implies one. Here I can write. So one implies three. So this is by lemma. By lemma. And again, three implies one. Uh, one can again sketch here. So let me just write down here itself. R three implies one. Uh, use uh, uh, lemma and theorem A of theorem A of uh, uh, this theorem A of above. No, above the, uh, yeah, theorem A as above. Theorem A as above, yeah, and then it will prove. So what we have proven, one, if I know one implies two, two implies one, one implies three, three implies one, and this uh, one implies three, three implies one modulo the proof of this lemma that we will be proving in the next lecture. And so now I would like to stop here. So thank you very much. Uh, sir, in this lemma, the second statement, uh, Z iota by P. So this ring structure will be Z P iota like. Uh, sorry? This... Uh, the, le uh, the lemma, the second statement, the uh -huh. ring Z iota. Yes, this uh, is a field. Hmm. Yes. So what you would like to say that this? Ring structure, uh, field. So it will be like Z P iota. Uh, ZP iota, uh, uh, that what you mean that uh, Z mod P Z i? Yes. Uh, first of all, uh, uh, this notation uh, is it a field? Mm. Sorry, no. Yeah, yeah but anyway, uh, all these things also can be handled. Uh, okay. That in the future, uh, right. Uh, in fact, I, uh, so we cannot say that uh, it is precisely this field. And what we can say that since it is a prime element and it is a PID, so ideal generated by P will be a maximal ideal in this ring, so is a field. That's okay. obvious, yeah. But uh, it is not saying that this is like this thing, yeah. Right, right, okay, sir. Thank you. So are there any more questions or comments?